Leo rightly said some of her some of the critics of the program have said that the financial reform goes too far. Some have said it did not go far enough. Some have said, in particular, that the failure to break up the institutions that are, quote, too big to fail, unquote, maintains uh, an inherent and very high degree of moral hazard, assures future bailouts, does not provide the kind of restraint on responsible lending behavior in the future that are necessary to avoid crisis. How do you respond to that? So I think, is my mic my on? No. All right. Yes, yeah. now? The little green light shows you're okay. Is it working now? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so generally speaking, I think the legislation um, that uh, the president just signed into law uh, contains very strong measures, um, but carefully crafted uh, measures to address um, the uh, moral hazard associated with too big to fail. And I can just sort of go over just some of the core elements, um, but they are mutually reinforcing. So the ability of regulators uh, to oversee these largest, uh, most interconnected uh, financial firms is materially improved by the creation of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and by the fact that the supervisors will be working together to regulate these institutions on a consolidated basis. And that moreover, their mandate is not just to look at the solvency of the particular institutions, but really to look at the risk to the system overall. So that's a huge change. And a change that is very much in conformity with G20 principles, and something that the Europeans, for instance, are also working on in terms of their architectural uh, innovations. Secondly, it provides, uh, for the first time, clear governmental authority, appropriately uh, constrained, appropriately um, uh, during times of crisis, uh, for resolution authority for the largest and most interconnected firms. And so making the system safe for failure is a major change. It also will require financial institutions to develop plans, resolution plans, plans that detail um, precisely how these institutions uh, would be unwound, resolved uh, in times of crisis. Um, and internationally... These um, are the living wills. We, we, we refer to them generally as, as, resol as resolution plans. Um, and uh, internationally, there is a very strong work program uh, in recognition that many of these institutions have cross-border uh, operations, ensuring that other members, uh, other major financial jurisdictions themselves have much stronger resolution authority in their national legislation, and that the supervisory colleges are working across borders uh, to ensure that in the event of crisis, um, it would be uh, much easier than it has been in the past, while also building up the uh, shock absorbers in the system uh, so that the, the failure of a large interconnected firm uh, would be uh, much less damaging uh, to the system overall. Okay. Uh, we'll stick with questions on this set of topics for a while. Let me ask each of you to identify yourself and then fire away. We've got standing mic in the back and a couple of traveling mics here. We've got two questions uh, up here. Brad Smith with the American Council of Life Insurers. I'd just like to congratulate you on the uh, administration being given the authority uh, last week with the implementation of the legislation to represent U.S. insurance companies operating internationally. As you may know, it's been a long-standing frustration of many of our G20 partners and indeed our industry that when the rest of the world spoke about financial services regulation, they meant banking, securities, insurance, and, and other um, lines of business, but that the U.S. government had no mechanism to represent the insurance industry and we were in, instead represented by our state regulators who don't really have the resources or the legal mandate um, to do so. Can I just ask the, the, the part in the bill, Title V, which creates the FIO, the Federal Insurance Office is, is relatively brief. And it, it says that the Treasury Department and the FIO should represent the U.S. insurance uh, sector internationally as appropriate. Um, we're having a great deal of debate now about what as appropriate means. As you may know, um, we, we have many long-standing challenges 
and currently we actually have what we would be considered to be crises. And I'll just highlight two of them and then ask you your thinking and the priority with which the creation and the funding of the FIO um, currently has on, on what I'm sure is a very lar large list of priorities the department has. Currently, uh, Europe is implementing Solvency II, which is a, a major revision and solvency reform um, in Europe. One part of that has to do with the determination of the equivalency of other regulatory regimes and whether our companies will be given credit for our home country capital. Just asking that, that's, that there's a current time frame of about eight weeks where they're uh, asking for comments on the criteria for equivalency and just wondering to what extent the department is, is tracking this and as you implement, I believe the FIO was created day one um, after the passage of the bill, whether the department plans to engage. And then a second very high priority for us um, is Japan is the world's second largest insurance market outside the United States. And there has been long standing consideration of uh, the, the reform of the Japanese postal insurance provider, which is the world's largest life insurance um, company. With the new government in Japan, we're, we're at, we've been actively concerned um, that that will lead to extension of preferential treatment and actually expansion of preferential treatment. Now with the FIO being able to represent um, the U.S. Uh, on international insurance matters, to what extent um, do you anticipate the department having the resources and the priority to be able to engage on both these issues? Thank you. So on the um, Federal Insurance Office, we uh, agree that um, this is going to be um, an important enhancement of our ability for the U.S. Um, to uh, engage uh, in international uh, discussions with other regulators uh, about the insurance sector here in the U.S. Uh, it's a very high priority. It's something that um, we have a, uh, a set of um, uh, implementation benchmarks and we're working uh, against them uh, very uh, aggressively. Um, and we do believe that um, the FIA will help us uh, both in being represented in um, organizations like IAIS, but also uh, in working on this very important um, issue of equivalency with the European Union. So that is something. The um, authority given to that office is very carefully constructed um, so that it um, respects the authorities of state insurance uh, commissioners, as, as I'm sure you know, um, but does so in a way that does give the U.S. Uh, a better position to actually discuss some of the uh, federal uh, cross state issues at the international level. With regard to the issue of the Japanese uh, postal and savings system, we're already very engaged on this issue. We're with the last uh, government, will continue to be a very important issue to us, um, and we'll continue to do that uh, from Treasury uh, under the new uh, structure, uh, just as we have been up until this point. I might just mention, though I hope you know that already that the Institute has published a very strong analysis of the Japan Post problem, uh, arguing very strenuously against uh, relapse from the Koizumi reforms that were intended to move Japan Bank, Japan Insurance uh, in directions that would be compatible with their international obligations, as well as equivalent domestic treatment between private and government subsidized Japanese firm. So uh, that is a very big one on the. Though I haven't read every single policy brief from the Peterson Institute, I actually have read that one. So very helpful. No, I, uh, next question. Thank you. Elial, El after reading all 3,000 pages, no, I'm just kidding, of the bill, uh, I had the following Please question. Please identify. Uh, uh, Michael Pomerlano. Uh, uh, I have the following question. I, I have written extensively uh, about the desirability of a financial stability council as opposed to putting it in the Fed because for simple reason, because stability is much broader than just the jurisdiction of the Fed. But on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, having uh, the Secretary of the Treasury chairing it injects a political element. Uh, of course, Tim is above reproach. Uh, we don't doubt he will do the right thing. I'm just, well, I'm not kidding, but, <laughs> but, uh, but what happens next time? I mean, uh, the SNL crisis with, uh, you know, with uh, Bush being instructing uh, Baker not to open the Pandora box and all that, and suppressing everything until Glauber and all this came along. So you have a problem now. What will be the governance of the council, which is not clear? 
What will be the tools that the council will be given? Will it be given any uh, uh, tools, uh, macro prudential tools? Will it have its own independent staff or rely on existing staff? Can, can you talk more about how this thing will be operational and how it will be credible? Well, so let me just, um, I can't um, speak to uh, all of the specifics because some of them are, of course, uh, going to be worked out uh, in the coming days. Um, but with regard to the overall structure of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, I think the council includes the re regulators and supervisors and the Treasury Department, all of the actors who, in practice, have to work together uh, day in, day out during the financial crisis. And under any circumstances, under any kind of um, broader uh, financial uh, stresses, these are the actors that need to coordinate and work together uh, in any case. So it's got all the right people at the table. It also has all the right entities at the table in terms of ensuring that the regulatory and supervisory system is seamless so that we don't see the kind of falling between the various uh, cracks or, in fact, charter shopping that was a real problem uh, during the crisis. Uh, so we think it addresses a very clear need um, that was uh, identified during the crisis and that the authorities are very carefully constructed so that the supervisors and regulators will continue to uh, have the predominant role in implementation uh, of the um, decision making uh, of this body. In terms of uh, capacities, there is a new financial research, uh, research office that will be independent but located within Treasury and that will have the ability to do a lot of the analytics and the research that are critical for making some of the judgments that that <coughs> council will be asked to make. So we think it's carefully constructed in terms of its authorities, strikes the right balance, but creates authorities that were very clearly missing and very clearly uh, their, their lack was a clear contributor to the crisis itself. Other questions on this set of topics? Yes. Thank you. I'm Tom Walk, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi UFCA, the Japanese bank. Um, my uh, question is whether the United States government or Federal Reserve continue to have the power of uh, um, the lender of the last resort, I think you mentioned that. Um, the, the financial sector always depends on the really the financial kind of absolute power to repayment. I think that's um, back to the government's power. Governments can collect tax, whatever, and then um, finally stabilize the market. And the United States performed brilliantly in this financial crisis. But uh, on this way of discussion of financial reform, I, I feel something that the taxpayers' money should, be, should not be used. And I mean, so strong opposition about uh, using taxpayers' money or depends on taxpayers. A lot of those discussions, I just wonder, what's your um, the assessment whether the United States government continue to have such absolute power in this reform, or um, whether this is somewhat limited, it as shown in the um, uh, Europe's response about the rescue of uh, Greece situation. Um, so let me see if I I'll try to answer your question. Um, with regard to um, the extraordinary interventions that were seen during the crisis, I think uh, President Obama and Secretary Geithner have been on record, and it is also clear um, in the legislation that taxpayers should not be responsible for shouldering uh, the burdens of any cost associated uh, with extraordinary interventions into the banking system. The financial institutions should shoulder their cost. And um, that is, in fact, done in a variety of mechanisms, um, both in terms of uh, provisionally, in terms of future crises, and in terms of paying back, for instance, the cost of TARP uh, during this crisis. Uh, internationally, there has been a bit of a debate about that um, in, in the G20 with some of the countries who did not intervene in their financial systems um, uh, properly um, being unwilling to uh, create a, a financial sector um, recovery mechanism. And so I think the, the agreement that was reached in Toronto on that, I think is, it strikes the right balance. 
Um, it essentially uh, has broad uh, commitment, G20-wide commitment to the principle the taxpayer should not bear the burden for any extraordinary government interventions that the financial sector should, um, but leaves to individual countries the mechanism, ex post or ex ante, um, to do that, but agrees on principles that it should penalize the most risky activity and create a, a level playing field. But I think just to add to that, I think there's one of the critical dimension to at least the way I understood the question when you were asking about lender of last resort, you focused on the role of governments and who would pay the bill for something like TARP, and, and Leo answered accordingly. But there's the central bank and the Federal Reserve, and I, I'm going to put it as a question, but I assume you did not mean to say that the Federal Reserve could no longer do the kind of things it did, or the ECB did, or the Bank of Japan has done in the face of crises in their countries to respond from the central bank side, which I've always viewed as the true lender of last resort. No, I think the lender of last resort function, um, many of the central banks um, you know, clearly played a critical role during the crisis, and their authorities would in no way um, be altered to continue doing that. OK, others on this topic? Yes, in the back. Nope. OK, um, maybe let's segue to some of the broader things, Leo, you touched upon at the outset. Um, you mentioned in the biggest issue of all, keeping the recovery going and who should continue to stimulate and who should restrain. And you said, rightly to my way of thinking at least, different countries should have different courses of action. But in the last few weeks, months maybe, even the last few days, we've had some powerful voices saying it's time for everybody to restrain. No less, no less than Jean-Claude Trichet says everybody should consolidate. German policy, despite the fact that they're under no pressure from any markets anywhere to the naked eye, uh, are consolidating, headed for balanced budget. Uh, so where do we stand on that? Uh, you stressed rightly at the outset G20 had done a very effective job responding to the crisis. But is that cohesion still together, or are things starting to fray now with people going off in different directions on really the central topic now for global macro policy? The, um, the conversations um, in Toronto and before that, uh, I'd say in Busan, I think on this topic uh, were actually um, very nuanced. Um, and uh, very high quality in terms of recognizing that uh, we are each individually and together collectively um, striking a rather delicate balance at this juncture. Uh, on the one hand, signaling to the markets that we have a credible medium term commitment to bring public finances onto a sound footing. On the other hand, retaining the policy flexibility now to continue supporting the recovery and supporting that critical handoff to the private sector. And precisely at what juncture um, the policy uh, sort of balance shifts from the one to the other is going to vary uh, to some degree between uh, the major economies. Um, and even more so uh, between the major economies and some of the peripheral economies. Now, different countries um, are subject to different pressures from the financial markets uh, in terms of their um, ability to continue financing deficits. And so all of those things are going to um, lead to slightly different balances uh, between uh, different countries. But there was a very clear discussion uh, in Toronto, and it's reflected in the document uh, that came out of it, that the pace of exit has to be carefully uh, calibrated. And we have to ensure that there is uh, no risk of uh, a synchronized, um, uh, overly accelerated um, withdrawal of stimulus or risk the pace of the recovery overall. So I think that um, the broad commitment um, to have by 2013 to stabilize by 2016 was the signal to the markets uh, that we're all on this course, that public finances need to be put on a sound basis, 
and that we want to do so in a way that's credible, but in no way jeopardizes this uh, recovery that is still in early phases. Uh, let me follow up by being a little indelicate <laughs> and asking a couple of specific cases in point for implementation of that strategy. The United States. Has the United States done enough yet to indicate its seriousness about addressing its debt and deficit problems? The President's enunciated the goals, as you said, we've got a commission, but has the U.S. done enough on medium-run consolidation to assure credibility for its overall stance? On the other side, Germany, as I mentioned, has already put in place a fairly sharp policy of consolidating its budget deficits at a time when it's the world's number one or number two external surplus country, no pressure from the markets, need by its European partners, if not the world as a whole, to impart some growth to get them back on track. So it's, I'm attempting to raise a balanced question. Is the United States inadequate in dealing with the medium term consolidation part? Is Germany moving prematurely, and perhaps Northern Europe, a third or so of the EU, which is still in good financial shape, are they moving prematurely and risking cutting off the recovery prematurely? So uh, just with regard to um, the first uh, question, first of all, just to um, start uh, from when the administration uh, entered office, we started um, without having any policy of our own with a $1.2 trillion deficit. So, um, and in the midst of just the most severe recession uh, that anybody's seen for decades, uh, steep mounting uh, job losses and um, financial markets really, uh, in many respects, uh, deeply, uh, deeply disrupted. The additional stimulus um, has made a material contribution to supporting um, the uh, recovery. Um, and the president has uh, always uh, tried to position that in the context of a medium term uh, fiscal consolidation uh, path, buttressed by procedural and policy mechanisms that make that path credible. PAYGO, reinstated. <laughs> Health care reform, hugely consequential from a fiscal point of view, um, both in uh, this next uh, budget window, but also even more significantly in the out year. So has already taken some very tough policy actions and put in place um, some measures, some procedural measures that will help uh, to achieve the goal. We have by 2013, just by virtue of projected growth um, and the expiration of policy measures and the unwinding of some uh, Recovery Act, we get to 4% um, on that same trajectory. It's really that last one percentage point in that last year that the Fiscal Commission uh, is designed to address. And I would say that the markets um, show every sign of, of believing in the credibility of our policies. So we actually have a fairly steep reduction um, in the first few years of our budget uh, deficit. And the real question is just making sure that we're supporting the recovery enough now, because obviously growth is the critically, you know, sort of single most important issue in terms of whether that fiscal trajectory is sustainable. With regard to Germany, um, we are very focused and have been in our conversations um, with uh, all key European economies that as some of the periphery countries are uh, really forced to contract fiscally, um, that there be enough offsetting uh, internal demand that overall uh, the euro area can recover and grow. And so that is, I think, a central and should be a central uh, priority for us with Europe. And of course, it is within Europe as well. The question there is just whether economies like Germany, who have uh, been uh, quite reliant on exports for growth, can find the right mix of policies uh, to uh, increase the role of internal demand uh, in generating their growth and in supporting European growth more generally. 
their fiscal uh, consolidation is actually relatively soft. Uh, if you look, they only go down by about a percentage point um, in the first year. But the real question, I think, for Germany and some of the other European economies that they are working on is the right set of structural reforms to reorient um, their demand uh, internally. Just one follow-up on that, and then we open it up. Uh, you mentioned Germany's tradition of export-led growth, and they've been pretty candid in reiterating that they uh, have no intention of abandoning that. Uh, question, as the whole European economy softens, and as the euro exchange rate has weakened considerably, although it's bounced back some now, do you worry that we might see a new global imbalance, a uh, significant surplus coming in Europe that would add on to the Asian surpluses, which if that happened, would certainly add pressure on our deficits and make it harder for us, not to mention the whole G20, to rebalance. What's your thinking on that nexus of topics? So the president has been very clear uh, with his G20 uh, counterparts from the start that we are not returning to the past patterns uh, of imbalances um, that um, really led us into this crisis, that the world needs to rebalance, that uh, the US consumer will no longer be the driver um, and no longer should be the driver for global growth, that we will save more as an economy and export more as an economy. And within the G20, uh, we had um, agreement around uh, the framework for stronger, sustainable, and more balanced growth that we agreed on um, in uh, Pittsburgh uh, last fall, which essentially is um, a mechanism to have the key countries, the key deficit countries, the key surplus countries, lay out their policy trajectories go f going forward have the IMF uh, analyze the consistency of those policy trajectories and what it means for overall growth, what it means for overall imbalances, and come back and have a really hard-nosed conversation about adjustments of those various policies. We're in the early stages of that, but I will say that in Toronto, um, there was universal commitment to this frame and to the policy objectives. And there is a lot of talk of rebalancing, particularly in China, um, but to some degree also uh, in Germany, I think appropriately so, rebalancing within Europe uh, as much as uh, overall. And so we'll, we'll see going forward whether the structural reforms that are put on the table um, and the fiscal paths are, are adequate um, to, to uh, achieve those goals. Okay, floor is open for any of this. Uh, over here and then in the middle. <clears throat> My name is Joe Marie Griesgraber with New Rules for Global Finance. And Lael, you said the magic word in terms of our agenda. And first, congratulations on your position. Delighted you can be out in the public. Uh, and that is the role of the IMF in this G20 thing. Uh, there's been a lot of calls and promises for IMF reform, and the IMF has a much expanded agenda because of the G20. And the legitimacy of the IMF is uh, hinges on the quota um, and voice and vote decisions coming up. Do you see, does the admi administration have an agenda for getting those numbers right, something that's uh, responsibly representative? Because we had uh, the managing director in this room recently, and he says, oh, we're going to get the right answers and then we'll figure out the formula behind it. And it sounded remarkably like 1944. And I don't think you get to legitimacy by playing with, you know, footsies with the numbers. So I'm wondering what the administration's approach to this is going to be in terms of getting to the, the January 2011 uh, decisions. Um, well, I think that um, IMF reform, governance reform, um, reform uh, or um, refining, uh, its tools and capabilities, um, a look at the appropriate size of resources. They're all on the table uh, for November, and very clearly so. Um, the IMF has played uh, a very constructive role during the crisis, um, served certainly uh, this nation's interests very well uh, during the crisis. Um, and going forward, it is important uh, to ensure that the IMF is viewed as a legitimate institution in the many countries uh, with when it sh within which it operates, and that its governance um, structure 
uh, its voting shares are increasingly reflective of the um, growing role of some of the developing economies in the world economy. So all of those things are very much on the table. It's uh, premature for me to suggest um, where we're going to come out, because it's still a very live um, set of discussions. Um, but I think the discussions are, all of the issues on the table, I think, are ones that you know well and that are you know, open for input, um, certainly from uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, and we, we obviously would benefit greatly from uh, thoughts of people in this institution, from your institution. I know Ted um, likes to fire in missives uh, quite periodically, which we find very useful. Um, but these issues are all on the table, and I think what we want to do is make sure that the IMF has the tools it needs, the resources it needs, but also the government governance structure that will ensure legitimacy in all the critical economies in the world um, as, uh, as we go uh, towards the uh, Seoul Summit uh, in November. Ted fires in missives and missiles yes. sometimes. <laughs> Ted, you want to have a follow-up to that? Nope. Nope. You're satisfied now? No more missiles? No missiles today. All right. Missives. Missives. All right. We've got a lot of... <laughs> Barry and then in front. Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. It is said that uh, unity in a G20 type forum can be easy to obtain at times of crisis, but far less easy when things get better. This is a very disparate group. It's an expanded group. It's more than 20 with entities and extra countries. I wonder if you could assess the effectiveness of the forum as you see it thus far and look at how it might be streamlined or how it might evolve looking forward. And as you do that, since you were so much in the midst in an earlier era, compare and contrast with the G7, G8. So I would just say um, this uh, question of whether um, the G20 uh, will be uh, as effective <coughs> in a period of robust growth, that would be a classy kind of problem to have, and I would welcome it. <laughs> so um, we're still uh, facing quite uh, substantial challenges um, as a nation and as a group of countries. And so we're still, I think, um, uh, working hard to agree some of these critical policy goals uh, together, including on um, uh, fundamentally reforming our respective financial systems with the global financial system and steering the right path to support the recovery um, and ensure that private sector handoff. Um, but in terms of um, how the G20 uh, is is operating, of course, you know it, it is more legitimate. Um, it has a broader representation. It has some of the key economies that really needed to be at that table um, that were missing uh, from the G7, G8. And so it is an improvement, but it's also we are very cognizant that it is not a uh, fully legitimate uh, governance uh, mechanism, and that there are institutional mechanisms like uh, the like at the IMF that we continue to work through. So it's it really helps to guide, um, but it is not in any way superseding decision making authorities uh, that sit elsewhere. Um, I think it has been useful to have it elevated to the leaders level, not just useful but essential. Uh, in steering the course of this crisis, that those uh, conversations among leaders, not, not just or even primarily in the room, but between meetings, the phone calls, the other sort of meetings that they're doing, means that decision making and having uh, politically vested um, authority in that decision making um, continues to benefit from a lot of very close uh, coordination. Um, the G7. Plays, continues to play a role. It's simply an informal role, um, and it is on some of the, you know, some of the sort of quicker moving crisis management issues that happen um, very uh, sort of unexpectedly between meetings. Um, but it is really the G20 that now um, is the right forum for agreeing uh, general goals that each national economy is going to work towards. Uh, general. Uh, guidelines for how some of the international institutions uh, will evolve. And I think that will continue to play an important role 
um, even as uh, we get to a period of much more robust growth. Tom? Give you a new job. <laughs> Just stand here. Tom Dusenberg, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, your uh, administration has announced a goal of doubling exports in five years, I believe. And uh, I wonder if you have a roadmap for getting there, uh, especially if you could uh, comment on how we're doing in Asia, where we seem to be rapidly losing market share. Um, the administration, as you know, the president convened um, for the first time uh, the uh, National Export uh, Cabinet um, and um, has uh, appointed a number of uh, CEOs to head um, the uh, President's Export Council and we're working together um, on uh, a set of um, mechanisms um, to achieve uh, those goals. Within Asia, in fact, our experience during the early stages of the recovery has been very positive. Um, our export growth to China um, in the first several quarters uh, has been much stronger uh, than export growth to many other parts of the world. Now, the key uh, challenge, of course, will be to maintain uh, and expand uh, those improvements uh, as we get further into uh, the recovery. And so um, we're using a, a variety of mechanisms on the macroeconomic front, we're working through the framework process uh, to ensure that countries like China, like Japan, who have long depended on an export-led growth model, undertake um, some serious structural reforms to reform the structure of their economy um, to increase the role of domestic demand. Um, and we've made some progress on that front, but we're going to keep working it um, and keep working it uh, very hard. But to some degree, we have seen a change in internal discussions within China with an acknowledged need uh, to move to a more domestic demand-led growth model. Um, on the front of um, the uh, tools that the government has, we're making sure that we have all of the, the export financing tools that we need, that we have all of the mechanisms uh, for small business to help them access uh, foreign markets many of whom um, are not yet exporting, um, but, but could, um, and ensuring that all of the mechanisms to help sustain uh, companies, American companies, as they export abroad are in place. And then the third piece, of course, critically important, is ensuring that we continue to focus on breaking down the barriers that impede our access. And so you know, we have a variety of different discussions bilaterally with a bunch of different countries. Um, the president has um, recently, uh, with the President of Korea, announced the uh, intention to really reinvigorate conversations towards the Korean FTA, so negotiators are going back to the table to work on that um, very hard. And uh, with China, we have a um, very robust set of conversations through the Strategic and Economic Dialogue and the JCCT to address concerns about government procurement policies, um, about policies that are termed indigenous innovation, but that really have the character of discriminating against our firms. And so with all the key markets in Asia, we're really working hard to make sure that markets are open and that our exporters, given the right tools, uh, can materially increase um, their share and their penetration of those markets. Well, just a brief follow-up on that. Would you say it's essential in achieving the overall rebalancing goal that you talked about earlier to effectively achieve the doubling export objective? We uh, believe that um, part of rebalancing uh, will naturally involve a doubling of our exports and um, that, that the world wants us to do that, um, that it is better for us and better for the world to be on a path of growth uh, that is more balanced. Jessica and then uh, Chris. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, a first a comment to Fred, um, uh, Jessica Einhorn, um, Dean of Sutz. Uh, on the, uh, I'm going to ask Fred if he feels like it afterwards to come back on the note that you put out on international tax policy and its relationship to exports. That was one of the strongest notes that I think I've ever seen from the Peterson Institute criticizing uh, government policy in terms of the tax proposals that were aligned to the stimulus bill. 
and it would be interesting to hear more on that if, if that's something that, that you would take up. But I want to turn to the strategic economic dialogue and the relationship with China, uh, where you and Treasury will play such an important role and where the legacy was great from Hank Paulson uh, going forward. And ask you in particular um, about the comments that we're hearing uh, from business, private business officials, um, first uh, as reported on Jeff Immelt, and then our own Jim Owens, who's the uh, chairman of our executive committee, and now, of course, the astonishing reports coming out of uh, Angela Merkel's uh, trips, and whether um, this issue of reciprocal treatment uh, for companies um, uh, operating in one another's countries is likely um, to reach a level that it would become an important element of the strategic economic dialogue. But anything else you want to say about the SCD? So um, the um, strategic and economic dialogue um, has actually um, very, um, as, as it's sort of two big priorities. Um, was uh, going into, really established at the first strategic and economic dialogue undertaken by this administration. Um, you know, we had sort of four major areas that we laid out to work on uh, with our counterparts in China. Um, the overall uh, macroeconomic rebalancing, um, which entails in both cases a lot of critical domestic economic policies to uh, put our growth paths onto a different trajectory. Um, continued liberalization reform of the financial services sector. Third, uh, ensuring a much healthier um, trade relationship that would gain much greater support on the part of the American people. Uh, and then finally working together in multilateral fora. And we have worked very hard on um, that third basket. Um, we worked very hard when uh, we were in uh, Beijing on uh, May 24th. Um, the host of policies termed indigenous innovation policies were all squarely high priorities um, of the host of cabinet ministers. We had heads of 11 agencies uh, on the economic side of the dialogue alone, so it was very high level representation, all singing from the same songbook, which is um, you're changing the rules of the game in ways um, that are potentially uh, deleterious to our economic interests to the jobs that are supported by exports here at home, um, and that uh, we are going to push very hard to ensure um, that those policies uh, are either changed or not put in place and begin. And that goes across government <coughs> procurement. It goes across the product accreditation system, intellectual property enforcement. Since that time, this is something that the president uh, has continued that conversation with President Hu. Um, and uh, we're working uh, through a whole host of mechanisms, the investment forum that we have with China. We will also um, work on it um, as we go into uh, the JCCT agree uh, discussions uh, in the fall. So this is a set of issues that are very squarely on the table, and I think we also work a lot with our European and Japanese counterparts because these issues are problematic uh, for a much larger set of companies that are already heavily focused on in exporting into the Chinese market and whose uh, investments these many years um, would be, um, unless we continue to work this very hard, we won't see as much uh, export performance as we are determined to see. But let me pick up on Jessica's preambular question because in your distinguished academic days, I recall that you did a lot of work on foreign investment and how it related to trade and all that. This was one of Leo's specialties uh, back at MIT. Um, I don't know if you've read that particular policy brief of ours, also written by Gary Huffpower, but it took the administration to task for suggesting increased taxation of the foreign income of American firms because we think you've got the sign wrong. The premise of the administration's policy seems to be that outward direct investment by American firms hurts U.S. exports in the U.S. economy and therefore ought to be taxed more in order, in part, to discourage it. All of our work suggests the opposite, that foreign direct investment by American firms promotes American exports so that if you pursue the tax policies that have been suggested, you would actually be countering 
your own strategy to double exports over five years. So let me just say, this is one of the few policy briefs from the Peterson Institute that I have not yet read, but uh -huh. I will go back right now. Somebody get sure. it for I really. Mean, <laughs> let me just say, the administration's policy is to level the playing field between investing here and making sure there's no tax advantage that would provide incentives uh, for firms to invest abroad when um, the investment could instead uh, be made here. So it's not, it's not that there is not a broad appreciation that exports and investment uh, go often uh, hand in hand. And as we are um, in negotiations in China, in a host of countries, we're very much supporting the interests of US businesses and workers more generally. And so a lot of the issues uh, that we're discussing are issues that are confronting our investors as well as our exporters. And we are equally concerned um, because they do come back uh, to harm uh, our jobs back here in the US. So the issue you're saying is really whether US tax treatment gives preferential advantage to investing abroad. Yes, I think it's what we are very focused on is making sure that there's a level playing field, but there's a broad recognition that um, exports uh, are frequently supported by foreign investment abroad. Okay, Chris. Thanks, Fred. Uh, thanks, Lil. Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. It's great to see you in a sanctified state, as it were. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about China quite a bit, and I don't want to lower the conversation to mere politics, but. Uh, uh, Chairman Levin has announced he's going to have hearings on uh, renminbi, and uh, he's specifically going to take a look at, I think it's Tim Ryan's legislation, which is not what I'm asking about. Uh, my question is the more general one. You've been now observing and then participating in the uh, negotiations and discussions with China on the whole currency imbalance situation. Fred's written a ton of stuff about it. From what you've seen and what you've, uh, you, as you've been working with the Chinese, is the congressional focus on uh, a legislative approach to renminbi, uh, does that help your discussions or is it a, uh, you know, sort of a sideshow that diverts? And if it looks like this fall, Levin is going to take the brakes off that he's had on it and really push a legislative approach to, to renminbi, uh, how do you think Churchill is likely to react to that? Is that going to help you with the Chinese or is that going to be one more complication for you? Thanks. So let me um, just say that we share, and I think it's uh, probably um, clear, um, that we very much share uh, the concerns um, of many members of Congress and, and the goal of uh, many members of Congress um, in ensuring uh, that China takes seriously the need to rebalance its economy uh, the need to uh, in, increase the role of domestic demand in its growth, uh, and as part of that, uh, the need to allow uh, its exchange rate uh, to appreciate uh, in response uh, to market forces. The approach that we take uh, may differ, uh, but the goal is one uh, that we very much uh, share. And I think you know we have said uh, we welcomed. Um, the uh, change uh, of approach um, by uh, the Chinese authorities when they <coughs> announced uh, that they would move to a flexible exchange rate mechanism. Um, but for us, what matters is how far and how fast uh, the RMB appreciates uh, in response to market forces. And we will be watching that uh, and monitoring that very closely in the weeks ahead. How would you characterize the first month? They've made that announcement a little over a month ago. The appreciation as of Friday was 0.8%. Uh, how would you characterize it so far? So what we um, said in the uh, foreign exchange report that we released, I think, on uh, July 9th um, was that um, over the course, I think, of about three or four years, um, the uh, RMB between 2005, 2007, 2008 actually appreciated about 20%, but it did so at very different uh, paces during that time. Um, and also recognized um, that uh, as a central bank is undertaking 
um, a uh, exchange rate uh, liberalization but a managed uh, float that uh, it is difficult to pre-announce um, the extent uh, and pace of appreciation because of course market dynamics uh, will make it difficult then to manage. That said, um, we came to the clear conclusion um, that the uh, RMB uh, remains undervalued um, and we will uh, watch very closely how far and also how fast uh, it moves in response to market forces. Okay. Uh, question now, back in the back. Appreciate it, Ian Talley, Dow Jones. Uh, one, are you concerned about the stress tests uh, that they don't adequately show the risk to sovereign debt? Uh, or are you more concerned that the, as you say, the, as the market's digested, the results of the stress test, the European stress test, that they won't buy it? Uh, and secondly, um, uh, are you, do you have any concern that the need for recapitalizing European banks um, uh, and the cost that that will take uh, as they recapitalize uh, has been a very high risk premium in the markets as they seek new financing, will undermine uh, the recovery there and therefore the global recovery? So with regard to um, the European stress tests, uh, the increase in transparency and the extent of disclosure uh, is uh, a very uh, welcome improvement. Uh, bank by bank, covering a much larger uh, segment uh, of the banking sector um, with exposures uh, to a whole host of different assets um, clear uh, at a bank level. So in that sense, uh, we, we very much welcome this step and think that it will contribute to market stability by providing the markets with the information they need to assess uh, the health of individual institutions. Um, I believe also um, that uh, the Europeans uh, have, uh, the national authorities have been clear about their continued access uh, to capital backstops. Uh, if and where needed. And so uh, those two things together um, are, are really, a, 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 I think, a, a welcome step forward. Ambassador Han Duk Su, then Ambassador Hills, then Ambassador Batia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your pre uh, excellent presentations. I'm a Korean ambassador here in Washington. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, what is the uh, you know, positions of your governments on securing some kind of a so-called financial safety net at G20. Uh, as I Japanese colleague has said just before that in, at the crisis, uh, countries except the United States, Japan, or EU, most of the countries, the top priority issue is always how to secure or whether we have the enough level of foreign exchange reserves. So that is very critical for any countries affected by this kind of crisis, especially countries affected by a very heavy hemorrhaging of you know, foreign capital outside of the country because of psychological factors and, and some of the movements in the stock markets, bond markets, and so on. So these countries always would like to have some secure source of supply of foreign exchange reserves or foreign exchange resources in case of crisis. So some kind of a social safety net, financial safety net is absolutely necessary. That's why Korea is strongly proposing some kind of scheme to be adopted at the November summit at G20 meeting. Uh, we are curious to know whether these fiscal consolidation may have some impacts on the IMF's uh, securing, uh, of securing of additional resources enough to have a clear framework for this kind of establishing uh, financial safety net for the countries, uh, some countries outside of this uh, very advanced regions, uh, including United States, Europe, and Japan. 
So, um, Mr. Ambassador, I know that this is a um, high priority uh, for your president uh, going into the Seoul Summit, and it's one that we're supportive of and that we're working um, with your officials on. Um, the experience, I think, um, during the crisis uh, has uh, suggested that some of the new instruments uh, that the IMF um, had been working on for some time, but that were used for the first time during the crisis, in particular flexible credit line, um, proved uh, their value. And the question going forward is, can we strengthen uh, those mechanisms and augment them with potentially other tools um, to ensure uh, that uh, there are as more, um, more instruments available in a preventive manner going into a financial crisis. Um, so it's something we're still um, like on this question of resources, and I'm glad you raised it in that context. I think the various pieces, the governance piece that uh, Jeff Marie raised earlier, what are the um, capabilities uh, that the IMF should have, and what are the resources it will need, those are things that they are related. And so we'll be, I hope, working uh, with your government um, as we go towards the summit uh, in November uh, to, to move forward that agenda. Carl. Leo, thank you for being here and for a very nice presentation, very candid. Uh, you have mentioned exports as well you should with consumer demand very far down and fragile. And you've also mentioned the need to uh, uh, have government withdraw from being the sole source of support for our various economies. And uh, the president has talked about exports. Uh, I recognize the political problem that the, that the uh, uh, administration faces. But frankly, uh, with uh, Korea having uh, entered into a number of free trade agreements with large economies, including uh, uh, Europe, India, and uh, the Asians are already in effect. Uh, Colombia entered into an agreement with uh, uh, Canada and Europe and so forth. We are really on the sidelines. What is your uh, prognosis for when we can get up and start to run? I'm told by my uh, friends in the corporate sector that, uh, for example, a little economy like Panama offers a big company like Caterpillar huge opportunities as they revamp their, their canal system. So it isn't just our seventh largest trading partner, Korea. It is trade across the board. So thank you. Um, the question, I think, of uh, how to move forward um, and ensure uh, greater market opportunities for our firms, for our farmers, uh, for our workers, is, is a very important one uh, as we seek to uh, boost exports here and um, to rebalance our growth. The um, president is very committed um, and uh, stated that uh, in his conversation um, uh, with um, the president of Korea in um, Toronto um, to moving forward uh, to resolve remaining issues on the uh, Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, and we would very much uh, hope to have those resolved um, before in time for the, the November summit. We are also um, very uh, much uh, engaged on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this is something that the President announced his commitment to um, <coughs> last year at the APEC meeting, and those conversations are really starting, I think, to um, get into some detail, um, and uh, we hope that th those efforts will bear fruit as well. Um, we still have this critically important uh, discussion um, of the Doha round at the WTO, uh, and we, I think, have asked uh, some of our key trade partners to come back to the negotiating table and, and provide uh, some more market access to make that agreement one that we here in the U.S. and the U.S. Congress in particular, we get excited about. Not quite there yet, but still pushing on some of our uh, trade partners to uh, to really uh, meaningfully open their markets. Um, and of course, with respect uh, to Panama and Colombia, there are a few remaining issues in each case uh, that we're working through, but would hope um, to be able to work those through and build the congressional support for those as well. As you seek to move China or other trading partners on government procurement reform, does Buy America help you? Uh, and if not, is there something the administration 
vis-a-vis -vis Congress can do to be a little bit more forceful and clear on the subject? Um, in the, uh, with respect in particular um, to China, uh, China, as you know, is yet a signatory um, to the WTO government procurement agreement. Uh, we, we believe they should be. They've said they would like to be. Um, they just submitted a revised offer that makes some progress in some areas, but really does not go far enough in a host of other areas. Um, I believe that, uh, in part, uh, the benefits of being a signatory uh, to the government procurement agreement were in some ways um, heightened or amplified um, by the Buy America uh, provisions um, that uh, other countries who were outside uh, the GPA uh, recognized that they really should accelerate their own processes in order to be part of that broader agreement. Um, that, I, I think, was clearly the case um, in, for, for China and for perhaps some others. That said, uh, we're also uh, looking very carefully uh, to ensure um, that legislation um, that is pending now um, it strikes the right balance on government procurement. Um, and, and so we're looking very carefully at any provisions uh, that would move in that direction. OK, we've got two very patient folks back at the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm Toshi Ogata with the Asahi Shimbun Japanese newspaper. I have a follow-up question on European stress test. And uh, you mentioned you welcomed the release of the European stress test. But uh, as the other guy pointed out, the there has been a criticism that in the market still that the saying assumptions for the stress test are not severe enough compared to the US one. So do you are you satisfied with the level of the stress test in Europe? And do you expect them to have a additional disclosure or to have a, to have additional maybe tougher another stress test? Um, the Stress tests uh, that were released um, by SEBS and by national authorities in Europe on Friday um, had a materially uh, greater level of coverage uh, and of disclosure, uh, certainly than had been the case uh, with previous uh, stress tests. Um, and in that, um, we believe that they contributed um, materially to an increase in transparency, um, again, much broader exposure in terms of coverage, number of banks, size of banks, um, much um, bank by bank disclosure, which had not been done uh, previously, um, and very detailed information bank by bank uh, on exposures. Uh, our belief is that that kind of disclosure can materially enhance market discipline and market stability. Um, and so in that sense, uh, we welcome those stress tests. But a more disclosure may be required going forward? I think at this juncture, um, I'm simply um, able to say that the additional disclosure to this point is a significant uh, improvement over what we had seen previously. And so it gives the market additional tools for assessment. Bob? Uh, Bob Davis with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, your currency report, and you uh, just before, talked about the Chinese currency is undervalued. The IMF regularly calls the Chinese currency substantially undervalued. Do you think that's a better description? And what would the difference be? Um, just one, one thing before you answer it. You talked several times about 20% 20 over three years is what they've done in the past. And is that kind of a signal to, Japan, to China is what you would find acceptable? Um, just with regard to uh, our findings uh, in the foreign exchange report, it's, um, just let me mention that we looked at um, significant uh, ongoing reserve accumulation, um, the very significant over a longer time period productivity growth uh, that had not been matched uh, by exchange rate appreciation. Uh, as well as uh, persistent, um, although as you know right now much smaller, uh, current account imbalances as indicators, um, as um, uh, some of the signs that we look to to make the assessment that the RMB remains uh, undervalued. 
Uh, the IMF has its own assessment methodologies and they arrive at their conclusion uh, separately. Uh, that said, um, we do believe that the RMB uh, remains undervalued. Um, we have not publicly stated um, the extent to which we would assess that undervaluation. Um, and, um, and the uh, previous episode uh, is something that is worth noting um, simply because the pace of appreciation varied over that time period. In the first year, I think the, uh, uh, the one uh, appreciated 3.5%. The one appreciates 3.5% during the first year of this, um, this effort. Do you think that would be um, su substantial enough? That would, would that be acceptable to the U.S. government? So um, just again, let me just state, unfortunately, what I stated before is that you know, what, what matters to us is how far and how fast the currency is allowed to appreciate relative uh, to market forces. Um, but we have not stated a particular uh, benchmark for making that judgment. Leo, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, you subjected yourself on this first foray to uh, an hour of questions uh, from this uh, reasonably erudite group. Uh, we thank you for doing so. We wish you the best of success on this enormous portfolio that you're managing, and we'll look forward to staying in very constant touch. Thanks. Very much.